Hey, I'm Captain Bill Toady, co-host of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast, and I'm excited to be on the USS Missouri here, and this episode we're going to do a tour of Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and take you some places that you obviously do recognize, the USS Missouri, and we're going to take you some places that you may not recognize. Hope you enjoy this episode of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War. historic Royal Hawaiian Hotel. Some of America's most famous people stayed here, including President Roosevelt himself. But more to the point of the unauthorized history of the Pacific War, this is the place that World War II submariners would come during off patrol. So this is um, historic as it pertains to World War II. And I'm going to take you here and to other sites in and around Pearl Harbor. So if you watch PBS and you've seen Rick Steves' Europe, this week, we're bringing you Captain Toady's Pearl Harbor. The first place we want to bring you is my old office, but in World War II, during the attack on Pearl Harbor, it was Admiral Husband Kimmel's office. And we have a wonderful surprise for you, and we can call this a great reveal. So here we go to submarine base Pearl Harbor to Admiral Kimmel's office. So in the early days of submarine base, the guy that was sent here to actually build the base in 1919 was a then commander, Chester Nimitz. At the time he came here, this whole area was covered with cactus and albigorda trees. And the first thing he had to do is clear the trees. One of the first buildings that was built was a battery, combination battery torpedo shop. And that building still exists around the corner here. This building was actually built after Nimitz left his assignment. In 1920, the first collection of R-Class submarines was brought here as nine R-Class submarines. And Nimitz was still the commander here and, and essentially served as the Commodore. A submarine tender was brought here in 1920 as well, and it was designated as submarine base Pearl Harbor. Now, the building behind me was built in 1933 as the administration building for submarine base Pearl Harbor again, and when Pacific Fleet Headquarters was moved here on orders of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, then pack, sink pack fleet, James Richardson, uh, the only option he really had was the office in the corner. And so he moved his headquarters from San Diego to the corner office there, and that remained the sink pack fleet headquarters through the December 7th attack when Admiral Kimmel was sink pack fleet. And when he was relieved on December 31st by Chester Nimitz uh, on a submarine right on the finger piers, which don't exist anymore. Um, they were here when I was here as a junior officer, but they, they're now gone. Then Nimitz made this his office as well on the base that he built. Which brings us to our tour of Admiral Kimmel's office. The so Master Chief, I think we, you know, I've mentioned previously that, and as you already know, that the office that I operated out of when I was Commodore, that now your Commodore operates out of, was the office that Admiral Kimmel was in during the attack on Pearl Harbor. He actually rushed down here. Um, he was going to play golf that day. Uh, obviously, the attack started. He rushed down here as quickly as he could and watched the attack unfold from this office. That's not news. I mean, you all have a picture of him in the office. We do have something I think we want to reveal during this episode, and it's exciting. Um, but let's go in and take a look if we can. Yes, right? Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay, so here we are. And the plaque up there that we got put up there in 2004. <laughs> so, Commodore, nice to meet you. I'm Bill Toady. Hey, Dave Cox, nice to meet you. And I occupied this office 2003, almost exactly 20 years ago. And so... It was a great honor to be operating out of this historic office. I suspect you feel the same way. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So the funny story 
is that, you know, and it has to do with this window. So we've already revealed to the uh, viewers that this was the office that Admiral Kimmel watched the attack on Pearl Harbor unfold from. And when I was a junior officer, this was still the original window. Mm -hmm. And so the bullet that's famously represented by this scene from the movie Tora, Tora, Tora. So that bullet hole was still in the window. And the way they were preserving it, they had a kind of a block of wood on both sides of the hole and a bolt going through the middle of it with rubber to keep the water out. Mm -hmm. And so as a junior officer, the commanding officer of the submarine base who occupied the office in those days would bring you in when you're a new J.O. Mm -hmm. in Pearl Harbor and let you see the window. And it was kind of a rite of passage for us and mm -hmm. kind of ground you in how important this facility is and this submarine force is and it was very wonderful to see and when i found out i was coming back here to be commodore and this would be my office as soon as i got to pearl harbor i rushed up here only to find that the window had been replaced <laughs> and so yeah. you know it's like how did that happen this mm -hmm. is historic right mm -hmm. stories have been told about this for decades mm -hmm. and i figured out what had happened and what had happened was this place had never been listed on the national historic register mm -hmm. and so when somebody said hey there's a hole in the window and didn't know enough history to know why the hole was there. He said, ah, let's fix that window. Why is it broken? And they replaced the window, which should never have happened. So we got it listed on the National Historic Register, which is a good thing from a historic standpoint, but a bad thing when you're trying to repair termite damage. <laughs> Absolutely. <isn't it? laughs> yep. So you've had problems. I've created problems for you. <laughs> no, it's it's uh, problems that we we deal with, but uh, we we're keeping the termites at bay, and and we're trying to figure out what what the uh, appropriate his, historically relevant way to to fix this is. Yeah, but, oh, but, as, as you know, it's a process. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're not historic termite. Yeah, right, so exactly. I don't know what to do about that. Now I understand you do something similar with sailors who report into Submarine Squadron 7. We do. To, to make sure that they're grounded. What do you do? Well, our, the Command Master Chief and I, when uh, when new sailors report to submarines assigned to Submarine Squadron 7, they come sit at this conference table and we mm -hmm. talk to them about the importance of the submarine force in the Pacific and we talk to them about the history of this particular office and just how important the work they're doing on our submarines is. And I, th I think it has a really big impact. It's so wonderful you do that. If I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't think I did that with every sailor who reported mm -hmm. the squadron. I so we're going to share some video um, of what it looks like, what Admiral Kimmel would have watched. Now, one of the things you're going to see when, you, when I show you out this window is you're going to see there's a big white building in between this office and Ford Island where the attack was taking place over Ford Island. And the, the truth is that building did not exist. That was built as part of the submarine intermediate maintenance facility around the time I think I was CO in the late 90s. So he would have had a really direct line of sight between this office and Ford Island where the attack was taking place. So that you can't get the same view he got, but you get the to understand a little bit mm -hmm. of what he was seeing at the time. Yeah, so, but the other great news I wanted to share with you, Commodore, is um, we were, I was thinking about Nimitz, because as you know, Nimitz relieved Kimmel mm -hmm. as commander, Sink Pac, not Sink Pac fleet per se, and Sink Poa later, but it was Sink Pac he took over on December 31st, 1941. It occurred to me that the Sink Pac headquarters up in Makalapa wasn't finished, the building wasn't finished until August of 1942. And I started thinking, wait a minute, Midway was in June of 42. In every movie you see of Midway, they show Admiral Nimitz in this expansive, huge office, right? Mm -hmm. And with crowds of people gathered around him. And I'm thinking, that office didn't exist. He was mm -hmm. operating out of this office. Mm -hmm. And so I met, messaged back to Naval History and Heritage Command, and I said, am I missing something? Did 
was Admiral Nemes actually working out of this office when they were planning the Battle of Midway? And I got confirmation that he was. That's incredible. So, yeah, I mean, so Leighton was in one of these offices down, you know, mm -hmm. right outside yours in the outer mm -hmm. office here. Um, the chief of staff was here. This is where all of that happened with, you know, trying to confirm, you know, by trickery, mm -hmm. whether Midway was the actual Japanese target with mm -hmm. the, the whole distilling plant thing. And so whenever you see a movie that shows Woody Harrelson as Nimitz or Henry Fond as Nimitz in this big office, it wasn't, didn't happen. It was in this little tiny office. Mm -hmm. It's even better, isn't it, Commodore? Yeah, I, I didn't know that until you told me, but we actually have a Battle of Midway planning chart that mm -hmm. was a going away gift from my service on the Commander Pacific Fleet staff. And mm -hmm. so this is a, a standard going away gift for people who, who serve on that staff. The, your colleagues on the staff sign it for you. And so the whole time, this uh, planning Battle of Midway planning chart's been hanging in here, but we had no idea how, uh, how relevant that chart yeah, was. Yeah, it is. Maybe in a picture of Admiral Nimitz above it would be appropriate. Oh, now yeah, absolutely. Know, now, now, that we, now that we know this, that, yeah. that'll definitely be something to go look for. That's fantastic. You know, I think it was CNO Jay Johnson who declared that um, um, along with the Navy birthday, that the Navy ought to celebrate the Battle of Midway every year so as a war fighting focus. And one of the, this ought to be the center of gravity of that, in my yeah, view. Right? Absolutely. Now, yeah, now that we know that. We now that we know that. Right? Pay yeah. a little more attention <laughs> yeah, next so, time it goes, comes around. Great. Well, so thank you so much, Commodore, for allowing me to be here today with you. I know it was your busy man, um, and it took some time out of your schedule. But thank you. Very grateful. And I think our viewers will be very happy to see, to be brought, you know, the new story of the planning of the Battle of Midway. Yeah, thank you very much. You I really Take appreciate care. it. Take care. Now, I've talked a lot about midget submarines during the attack on Pearl Harbor. In fact, in a different video, I took you to the National Museum of the Pacific War, otherwise known as the Nimitz Museum, and I took you around HA-19, the midget submarine that was captured on Bellows Field. But I've always had a question as to where exactly that midget submarine grounded on Bellows Field. So now we're going to go out to Bellows Field because I think we figured it out. So I've been researching for a while exactly where the midget submarine um, beach, the one that, that rendered POW number one during the Japanese war. Um, and I think that I found that it's right here. Now I knew it was Bellows, but getting the exact spot, there's no historic marker or anything that I know of that shows exactly where that midget submarine beach. But it seems to be right here, because if you look over my shoulder, there's an island to, to your left. When you're navigating in these waters, we call it Rabbit Island. It's got a different name now. And that hill structure, we're on the east side of Oahu right now, fellas. And you could see clearly in the background of the photograph of the midget submarine as it's beach, that specific structure. And then if you look this way, we'll be able to see the hills there. There's a second photograph of the submarine with those hills in the background. So I think I've been able to triangulate the position of the midget submarine as right here, offshore, and it's the same because this area is not marked at all. It's a very historic spot. This is one of the boats that was supposed to have led the attack on Pearl Harbor at 3 o'clock in the morning, long before the carrier aircraft were to arrive. So this is a very historic spot. I have another video that I, where I walk you through that midget submarine designated HA-19. That submarine is today located in the Nimitz Museum or the National Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg, Texas. And I have done another video where I walk you through, the, around, I should say, not through, that midget submarine in Fredericksburg, Texas. And I'll put the link to that video right here so you can watch that video as well. But this is the spot where that midget submarine beached and um, the first capture of a Japanese military person in the entire war. 
This all begs the question of how the midget got to Bellows Field to begin with. But before I address that question, I've said previously how difficult it would be for a midget submarine to penetrate Pearl Harbor and line up for an attack. I want to show you what the channel looks like at Pearl Harbor that you have to maneuver into in order to enter the harbor. Now, this is something I did on a full-size submarine on the surface maybe 100 times over the course of my submarine career. So there are several courses you have to line up. First, you line up to the channel that's dredged to allow you to get into the mouth of the harbor to begin with. Then you have to make another turn, then another turn, and now you're just beginning to approach Fort Island. Now, if the midget was trying to get to the west side of Fort Island, it would have to turn again and again. If it was trying to get to the east side of Fort Island, it would have to make an even sharper turn, which is very difficult to do with that little rudder, and then turn again in order to line up its torpedoes for a torpedo attack. Now, if I zoom in on Pearl Harbor as it looked in December 7, 1941, if you're going to the east of Pearl Harbor where the Arizona and the Oklahoma are, it's, these are the courses you have to turn. Not too difficult if you get in that far, if you've gotten in that far. But then you've got to turn essentially 90 degrees to line your torpedoes up to towards the, let's say, Oklahoma, as an example. And, you know, there's speculation as to whether that ever happened. Now, if you're going to the west of Pearl Harbor, and there's no speculation as to whether that happened because the submarine, midget submarine, did actually get into there, there's HA-22 Tau, then you're going to have to come here and then turn again to line your torpedoes up. We're going to deal with HA-22 Tau separately. But it's very sharp turns that have to be made with a midget, 80 foot long midget submarine with a very small rudder. Needless to say, that's, that is very difficult. Now, returning to the Bellows Field issue, if you're trying to approach Pearl Harbor, this is kind of the vector you would want to do it on. Now, there are reports that HA-19, which was launched from I-24, had a gyro prompt before it was launched. And if you could see the launch point here, it doesn't take much of a gyro error for you to miss the south side of Oahu completely. And if you end up on the east side of Oahu and you're pretty much lost, this is where you would have to turn in order to approach land to, to ground at Bellows Field, which is what we know actually happened. You know, it's hard to understand how somebody can make an error like that. But if they've got a gyro problem and there are very, very few visual cues, well, let me just say to you that even in peacetime when I was doing this, the visual cues at, when you're approaching Oahu at night and these folks were doing it, let's say, 3 o'clock in the morning, are very confusing. And it's easy to get confused by the lights you see, um, what you might think is the Channel Harbor entrance is not, and you can easily start getting lined up on the wrong thing. And that's what I think happened here. There's been debate for decades as to whether or not the USS Oklahoma was sunk by a Japanese midget submarine. And a lot of people said, wait, it's way too hard to get midget submarines into Pearl Harbor, but we know with certainty that one did get in, that's the I-22 Tau, and the reason we know that is because it was sunk inside Pearl Harbor on the west side of Fort Island. And we're gonna take you there now and reveal exactly where that midget submarine went down. So there's a lot of conversation that's gone on about the Japanese midget submarines on the morning of December 7th. Everybody knows about the midget that was sunk by the ward uh, hours before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Most people know about the uh, midget submarines that you know, attempted to get in. There were five of them. There were 10 pilots, uh, basically a skipper and a, and a helmsman, torpedoman, 
uh, on each of these midgets. Four of the five were commanded by ensigns. The fifth was commanded by the actual instructor of the midget submarine school. And he was the only lieutenant in the group, and his name was Lieutenant Iwasa. The controversy involves whether Oklahoma was sunk by an airdrop torpedo or a midget submarine launch torpedo. The Type 97 midget submarine launch torpedoes had about twice the explosive power of the airdrop torpedoes, and there's one famous photograph with, with an enormous plume of water on the Oklahoma that some people say is, gives proof that it was a submarine launched and not an airdrop torpedo. But we know for sure that at least one midget got into the harbor. How do we know that? Because it was sunk in the harbor and recovered in the harbor. That was I-22 Tau, the midget submarine that was commanded by Lieutenant Iwasa. Now, in a separate video, I talk about the challenges of navigating a midget submarine through the, char the harbor channel entrance with the small rudder and making the kind of turns that would have been necessary in order to pivot and turn and direct its torpedoes against the target ships. And everybody knows about the main battleship row that the Arizona, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and the Oklahoma were at West Virginia, but there was a second ship row on the west side of Foyle Island here, and I'm going to refer to my notes, that included, again, the Utah, which famously was sunk and is still on the bottom. We'll cover that separately. But going from close to far down this line was the Tangier, Utah, Raleigh, and Detroit moored here on the west side of Ford Island. And there were a couple of ships that were anchored off of the point you see there, which is sometimes called Pearl City Point. And those ships were the Curtis and the Medusa over there. And then north was a line of destroyers that were moored. And one of those was the Monaghan. And that would have been anchored way north in a line of about 12 other destroyers. Um, out there. So, we're going to get back to the Monahan in a second. What we do know is that around 0830 on December 7th, a submarine, midget submarine broached right in the waters behind me here. And that midget submarine was, the, the attack was already in progress December 7th. And so that midget submarine was engaged. It, it attempted to pivot, to fire its torpedoes, but some of the surface ships, including the Curtis, which was anchored off of the point behind me there, engaged the midget submarine and started firing at it. Monaghan was, came, got underway, came south, and actually rammed this midget submarine that's I-22 Tau. It rammed it in the stern as it was discovered when the submarine was recovered dropping two depth charges on the midget after it rammed it. Simultaneously in this flurry of activity, the Curtis, which was, which was um, across the, the pier there, across the water there, is firing its gun at the midget submarine, its five-inch gun. The midget pivots, tries to fire a torpedo at Curtis. That torpedo misses... It it's actually misses to the left and goes off towards those anchored. Um, those are actually um, ships that have been mothballed in the distance there. The, the Curtis at that time succeeds in firing a five-inch round through the superstructure of the midget, decapitating the skipper, Lieutenant Iwasa, with that five-inch round. Now, that's going to sound very familiar to the midget that was sunk out of Pearl Harbor entrance by the USS Ward, which also had a five-inch round go through the superstructure of that submarine. Of course, that submarine's still on the bottom outside the harbor entrance. The combination of factors, that five-inch round, the ramming by the Monaghan, the two depth charges by the Monaghan, end up sinking the midget submarine here in the harbor 
and it's kind of unclear where exactly the sinking took place, a little bit of, of um, detective work, and it's about halfway between here and that point there. Now, the last act of that submarine before it sank was to fire its one remaining torpedo towards, probably towards the uh, Tangier, which was over here. That torpedo misses and impacts Ford Island. In fact, there's a, there was a story when I was living here that that torpedo actually climbed up on the beach and ended up in the house in what was then called Commander's Row on Ford Island. That has never been val that story has never been confirmed or validated. But the midget ends up here on on or about December 21st, which is two weeks after the attack. That midget's recovered by a crane and a barge. It ends up being, um, you know, taken apart to determine if there's anything we could learn about its construction, and it and it gets buried in landfill over in sub base uh, at what is now referred to as Sierra One under a parking lot in sub-base, but that's... I'm now at um, Pier Sierra 1 Alpha on submarine base Pearl Harbor. Behind you is the BOQ Lockwood Hall I lived in until I got married. Um, behind me, this pier, is a parking area that's throughout this region here, uh, is the location where the I-22 Tau Midget Submarine was dropped into a landfill. That's after it was recovered uh, on or about December 21st, 1941. The body of the skipper and crew member were removed and buried in Honolulu. The submarine was exploited to, for whatever intelligence could be gathered from it. And then, essentially, it was wrecked. I mean, the bow was blown off from the depth charges. The stern was dented from the time that USS Monaghan rammed it, it was a mess. And so rather than try to reconstruct it, um, turn it into a monument or anything like that, um, they decided to bury it here in this landfill. So somewhere over here at Sierra One is where that submarine is buried. Now remember that they, we had also captured HA-19, which would be referred to as I-24 Tau, on Bellows Beach. So we had a very well-constructed um, midget submarine example that could be exploited further. So, and that one was paraded across the country and used as on war bond drives. It was put on a truck and driven all over the place. That's the one that's in Fredericksburg, Texas, now at what I call the Nimitz Museum, um, National Museum of the Pacific War. But. HA-22 Tau is under here somewhere. The Smithsonian has confirmed that's where it is, but there is no uh, absolute identification of the precise spot here at Sierra 1 Alpha where it's buried. Everybody knows about the USS Arizona, but there is, of course, a second ship that was sunk and not re-raised after the attack on Pearl Harbor. And that's the USS Utah, another important war grave. To some extent, the story of Utah isn't told as much as it should be. This is, of course, the second ship at Fort Island that was not recovered after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the first being the Arizona. This is the USS Utah. When it, it was struck, it looked like an impressive battleship as it was moored here on Ford Island, and some Japanese pilots took a great amount of effort to go after this ship, even though it was not really operational anymore. It was used as a training slant target ship, and there was two aspects to that. The first aspect is it would get underway with anti-air crews, and those anti and it, had, it was bristling with anti-air guns, and those anti-air crews would practice firing those anti-air weapons at drones that were being towed behind aircraft. So they would get a lot of practice shooting at drones. And the second function was it itself would tow targets that other ships would shoot at. But it wasn't an operational battleship anymore, and yet it suffered the wrath 
of many Japanese pilots that believed it was an operational battleship, and, and, and it was hammered time after time after time. It ended up, ended up capsizing, and after December 7th, there was an effort made to recover trapped sailors within the hull, and there was an effort made to right it. Uh, the cutting holes in the hull to rescue trapped sailors. Only one sailor was rescued. I've forgotten his name. Um, and the effort to right the ship after it capsized was abandoned as well. It was stuck too deep in the mud. But you can see remnants of cables on the ship that are dangling from its hull there. And those cables were cut when they gave up trying to, um, to right it. Now, Arizona rightfully gets the majority of attention because the vast majority of sailors who died on December 7th died on the Arizona. Um, spectacular video of that. No spectacular video of this, but it should be remembered as a tomb for many of our brave sailors just as much as the Arizona is. Also in submarine base Pearl Harbor, we have the sail or superstructure from the World War II submarine USS Parchi. Now you're going to know USS Parchi because it was the submarine that Red Ramage earned his Medal of Honor. So it's a historic submarine and I'm going to take you around a tour of the external of the sail of USS Parchi. I'm standing in front of the USS Parchi Memorial. It's the superstructure of the actual World War II submarine. This, um, you see the four-inch deck gun is still here. You've got the anti-aircraft gun as well. And so the, the periscope shears, the, what we talk about all the time, the cigarette bridge is still here. Now the bridge is up there, so you can see where the uh, captain would have been standing, looking that way, the, the target-bearing transmitter, or TBT, not to be confused with the torpedo data computer, or TDC, which is in the conning tower. The TBT is up there on the bridge, so the bow is going this way. Great example of a World War II submarine. This one does have surface search radar. Uh, it had air search radar as well. It was uh, kind of dangerous to use the air search radar because it goes out quite a ways, and, and it gives away your location, the fact that you're there. And so if you want to remain undetected, you have to be very circumspect about the use of those radars. The whip antenna is the HF communications antenna you see sticking way up there. And both periscopes, you've got the attack periscope, which is the higher of the two, and then the night periscope, which is the lower of the two. You've got a radio direction finding piece of gear there. And of course, top side, we would have had the acoustic um, transducer for the sonars and things like that. But that's gone. This is just the superstructure. So it's an incredible piece of World War II history submarine force near and dear to my heart, not far from Lockwood Hall, which we'll talk about separately. You remember I talked about the Clean Sweep Bar and the, um, the Hall of Heroes, which is the Skipper's Lounge. Um, we'll, we'll show that uh, in a separate segment. At the submarine base Pearl Harbor is the Bachelor Officer Quarters that is now called Lockwood Hall. But of course in World War II it wasn't called that at all. But all of my submarine tours, junior officer through Commodore, except for executive officer, were in Pearl Harbor and I have great memories of Lockwood Hall and the Clean Sweep Bar and the Skipper's Lounge. And I've talked about the one time I found it necessary to break into the Skipper's Lounge. That's my one and only caper while I was a submarine CO, and we're gonna take you there now. During World War II, this was known as the submarine base bachelor officer quarters, or officer quarters. It was not known as Lockwood Hall yet because Lockwood hadn't made his mark in the war. He was sent to Australia early in the war, but this uh, building has history. Some of the greatest submariners during the war and after the war, whoever lived, have stayed here. And it's now called Lockwood Hall. The building was built in the 1930s. And it's just classic Art Deco style from that standpoint. Um, it's, it's a beautiful building. But 
inside the building there's a there's an area that's basically um, reception area uh, it's actually outdoors but on the other side of the building during World War II that reception area had a map of the Pacific painted on the floor and they would station marine guards here and talk through war games with that enormous map of the Pacific we'll see that in a minute Okay, I mentioned that the um, outdoor reception area of Lockwood Hall, called Bachelor of Support of Submarine Base Pearl Harbor, um, had a big map of the Pacific painted on it. That's this area here. And so the entire Pacific operating areas, the St. Poa, um, Admiral Nimitz and his staff had the entire Pacific um, operating area painted on the, on the floor and they would basically war game maneuvers and movements of ships in this area. Now that's all gone, obviously. Later this served as a place where we would receive deploying submarines. During the war, it, it did as well. So submarine crews would come here and they would have receptions for them. Both of my changes of command, USS Indianapolis and Submarine Squadron 3, were here. And I have embarrassing photos taken uh, during both of those events. But this is a place where basically it was the submarine, Pacific Submarine Force Center of Gravity for social events. Um, I've attended, my wife and I have attended literally 70 or 80 events in this area following submarines returning from deployment and changes of command and all those kinds of things. In Annapolis, I talk about the fact that when I was a junior officer here at Submarine Base Pearl Harbor, we would frequently do training sessions in a place called the Skipper's Lounge. The Skipper's Lounge existed during World War II, but the only people who were allowed in Skipper's Lounge during the war were submarine skippers who had actually already been on a war, war patrol. Once you got on a war patrol, usually you received the Navy Cross or something like that. And your picture went up on the wall here, we'll show you in a, in a second. And at that point, you were allowed to be in Skipper's Lounge. Now, when I was a junior officer here in the early 80s, we would conduct training in here. And when we go in there, you'll see why. So the captain would bring his officers in, and you'd be, you'd, you'd be surrounded by these photographs that we'll see in a second. When I took command of Indianapolis, unfortunately, this place was, um, was bolt, it had a lock on it. Basically, it was a padlock here. It was padlocked shut. And I thought we were, we were going to go on deployment in a very short time. We had a lot of work to do in a very short time. And I thought my officers needed a little inspiration. So I tried to get permission to get the key to open clean the, the, the skipper's lounge and bring my officers in there for some training sessions. I was running out of time. We were going to leave on patrol. I couldn't figure out how to break the code on the bureaucracy to get into this place. And so I went to a local hardware store and I bought bolt cutters and I came over here early in the morning and I cut the padlock off of this door. Now this, this kind of fancy lock didn't exist there. It was a regular doorknob with a padlock here. Cut that padlock over, had my officers come to this place so that they could experience this for the first time. And this is the skipper's lounge. Even though you aren't a skipper of a submarine who's gone on a war patrol, we're going to let you in. Come on. So, what you see on this wall, Roll of Honor Navy, is the Navy Cross Wall. Now, if you can get a look at all the submariners who receive Navy Cross. Now, wait, we're not done yet. You get this wall, and we're going to have to zoom out for you to see it all. So, we got all these photographs of Navy Cross recipients from World War II. These are just submarine COs and, and uh, XOs and, and officers here. So let me step back and show you. This is the Navy Cross. This is the second highest medal that a person can, can make. And all of those Navy Cross Award recipients from World War II. Then if I flip around here, And here's, here's Gene Flucky, and we talked about the fact that 
FDR was very ill when he received his Medal of Honor. Um, so it was presented by Secretary of the Navy Forrestal. And then we have Dick O'Kane, who I met when I was at the Academy. And then on this side, we have George Street, and we talked about him in a prior episode, and uh, Red Ramage, and showed his the, the superstructure of the Parchi, his ship. Um, and here we have posthumous award to Gilmore. Okay, and then, of course, down here as well, we've got a, a, just uh, three plaques, one for Sam Dealey, Gene Flucky, and Red Ramage. So, this is the Skipper's Lounge. Uh, it's one of the uh, battle ensigns of one of our submarines, and it's just one of the treasures uh, in military history that I'm so so sad to say that it's kind of you know not underrepresented as far as uh, its value you know, to the U.S. Navy today. Now this. This photograph was taken in Yokosuka, Japan, which I've been to probably 15, 20 times on a submarine. But this is dated 7 September 1945, the day of the Japanese surrender. A bunch of submarines pulled in Yokosuka. The officers went ashore and collectively took this photo. So if you've seen the movie Top Gun, there's an old cartoon by Jeff Bacon, uh, who I got to know, a Navy cartoonist called Broadsides. Uh, he wrote a cartoon once that said, here's a scene you never thought you would see. And after, Top Gun, after Hunt for Red October came out, the cartoon was uh, pilots, aviators, naval aviators in a bar pretending to be submariners to pick up women. So that was the scene that you never thought you'd see. But that bar scene in Top Gun when I was a junior officer could have been recreated here because this was the clean sweep bar officers club in sub-base Pearl Harbor, and this was a very active bar. We would have events. Basically, it was an open bar like any bar where alcohol was served uh, every day. Uh, it was not just open for special occasions. It was pretty much always open, and we would gather here after coming back from sea mostly on Fridays because we would go to sea during the week. We'd come back on Friday if we weren't deployed if we were deployed, obviously, we wouldn't come back for six, seven, eight months. But this was where we would do the hot wash of the week in the Clean Sweet Bar. In the early 90s, I'd say, the Navy took a disliking to alcohol for very good reasons. It was being abused. And pretty much all of the officer clubs around the Navy were shut down. But this one, it was especially heartbreaking because it has such historic uh, significance because this was also the place that patrols, or the, the crews that were returning from patrols, officers that were re returning from patrols would come after the patrol to talk about what had happened to them, what they were learning, and a lot of really important li lessons were shared here in submarine base Pearl Harbor, which is now called Lockwood Hall, which was the bachelor officer quarters then, clean sweep bar. Fort Island is such a historic spot in general. I want to take you to a few other sites on Fort Island, the Naval Air Station Fort Island as it was at the time, and some of those sites are still preserved. So here we are on a sunny and windy day on Fort Island, and unfortunately uh, the wind may interfere with my audio. But this empty field you see behind me is actually the historic runway of Fort Island. Now. It's grass. It was actually a soft surface back in World War II as well. It was n never really a hard surface. But this runway was active until I was a department head on a submarine. In the early 90s, when I was still flying Cessnas, I would take off out of Wheeler Field, and I would come down here, and we could still do touch and goes on this runway. But at some point, the Navy decided that they need, needed some of this land for houses, and they couldn't have the houses that close to an active runway. So the runway was essentially abandoned. But on this side of the runway, you see buildings that, had, that were there during the attack on Pearl Harbor. That, the building to the right was a PBY hangar. 
It's essentially abandoned right now. It's in very poor condition, almost as if it's falling apart. I hope something's done about that. The, the building next to it houses, was a run, was a hangar as well, but it now houses the Naval Aviation Museum of the Pacific. It's a wonderful museum. We'll talk about that later. And of course, the control tower for the, what was then Naval Air Station Ford Island is still there. And a great deal of reconstruction has gone into making sure that doesn't fall apart, which we're very grateful for. Because not 30 years ago, that thing was in very grave danger of falling apart. And, but it's iconic. It's seen in many of the Pearl Harbor photographs. That and the dive tower on submarine base were two landmarks that were used by the Japanese pilots as they conducted the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th. In the opening scenes of the John Wayne movie, In Harm's Way, there's a party at a swimming pool. It's December 6th, 1941, and the military officers, there's a combination of Navy and Marine Corps. I think, can't remember if there's Army in that opening scene. Everybody's in, in whites, and this is that swimming pool. It was filmed here. It's called the Arizona Swimming Pool. A band was on the other side there of the pool. So a lot of that movie was filmed here in Hawaii. We're still in Pearl Harbor. We're on Ford Island right now, though. And in fact, the house I lived in when I was Commodore is across the street. And down the street a bit is another house that we referred to as the John Wayne House. It was made smaller because John Wayne and Burgess Meredith lived in that house. And they, the rumor was, don't know if this is true or not, but they made the house smaller to make John Wayne look bigger. But it was December 6th of every year where I was stationed as an officer here in Pearl Harbor. In the evening, we would have a party at this very same pool that the In Harm's Way movie opens with, and we called it the In Harm's Way Party. And we would dress up in our service dress, whites, chokers, ribbons, as the ladies would dress in 1941 styles, and we would have a band, the Commander Pacific Fleet Band, and they would play, and we would essentially reenact that scene from the movie In Harm's Way here every year before this, the very solemn uh, ceremonies that would be held also here in Pearl Harbor each December 7th. So it would start with a party on December 6th just to memorialize the, the peace and the, the happiness and the fun here in Hawaii before that fateful morning. Okay, this is the house I lived in while I was Commodore here, but these houses predate World War II. They were built in the 1920s. And you're going to ask, why does a house in Hawaii have a chimney? In the days that these houses were built, the Navy only had one house design. So it didn't matter whether they were building the house in Maine or Hawaii. They were all the same. Now, the, the problem with that is that the middle of each of these living rooms had this huge fireplace to heat the house, which you didn't need in Hawaii. So some of the houses, the chimney's gone. It's because those occupants figured out that they didn't need the chimneys and had them removed with the fireplace to open up the house a lot uh, you know, greater. The problem was, at some point, somebody figured out these houses needed to be on the National Register of Historic Places. And so they got put on the National Register and after that happened, there was no removing the chimney in the fireplace. <laughs> so some of these houses still have the chimney and fireplace, and some don't. But the point, as it re pertains to World War II, is that there are photographs on the, behind these houses is the beach. The Arizona is that way. And there are photographs of December 7, 1941, where there are bodies littered on the, on the beach sides behind every one of these houses because, you know, so many people died and, and floated ashore. And so I think this is the only spot on Ford Island where you get a man, where you get a point of view of both the Arizona, where 1,177 sa sailors died, and essentially World War II began for us, as well as the Missouri, which, of course, was where the instrument of surrender was signed on the decks 
of the Missouri in September 1945, and World War II essentially ended for the world, not just for us. Um, one People may argue that, that World War II began for us when the USS Ward fired at the midget submarine outside of Pearl Harbor uh, in, in the early morning hours of December 7th before the airplane started flying over those mountains in the distance. But, you know, wh whatever way you, um, you want to, uh, to parse it, the point is that these are the two bookends of World War II. And, uh, you know, you've got to, got to stop here and pay tribute before we close this podcast out. December 7th was the beginning of World War II for the United States. World War II ended for the United States aboard USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. So in September 1945, this is the spot where the instrument of surrender was signed by uh, officials of the Imperial Japanese government. Uh, and of course, General MacArthur led that signature, that, that ceremony for the Allied nations. Admiral Nimitz ended up signing for the United States. Still controversy in the decision that that was going to be the order in my mind, but MacArthur had already been named as the supreme commander of the occupation forces, and so I guess it was appropriate. Um, you know, you've, you've heard our opinion on MacArthur. We'll set that aside for a moment. But this was a pretty incredible, iconic scene because there were sailors hanging. You can't see it because of the shroud here, or the covering. But there were sailors hanging from every spot, every rafter, every um, place a sailor can possibly observe the ceremony from. There were about 250 Allied ships in Tokyo Bay anchored when this went on. Um, Hundreds of Allied planes did an overflight to, as this kind of a show of force to show the Imperial Japanese Navy that we were far from defeated, and it, I think it really impressed them. Um, so it was an impressive spectacle, but it was, um, you know, as, it, as symbolic as it needed to be for the momentous occasion that it was. And here's a replica of the instrument of surrender here. On, um, you could see the, the various signatures, um, if I can get this without getting too much of a reflection. And, of course, there's Chester Nimitz's signatures on the top line. Um, Republic of China representative, United Kingdom representative, and so on and so forth, as, as are the, the Japanese signatures above. And, of course, it's been famously pointed out that the Japanese representatives were very highly dressed. They, they believed it should be a formal occasion. General MacArthur, in one of his more um, sane decisions, I would say, said that, no, we're going to be dressed the way we fight the war. Uh, apparently not everybody um, got the message because here's, here's Admiral Sir Bruce, Bruce Frazier in his whites, but everybody else was, was as close to working khaki uniforms um, as uh, appropriate for the day. And, of course, the Army wore khakis in those days, too. So this is a, an impressive place, an iconic spot, and really important to remember um, this spot uh, because it sits just a couple of hundred yards from that other iconic spot, which is the Arizona Memorial. So a lot of modifications have been made to the Missouri when it was recommissioned during the Reagan administration. Um, the World War II ship is still here, but some changes have been made. And we talk about the Battle of Okinawa, we, it's, uh, we kind of tangentially, when we get to 1945, we'll t address it more directly during the podcast. Um, in fact, we did how many, 12, 13 episodes on Guadalcanal? We'll probably do more than a few on Okinawa as well. Uh, I talk separately about the fact that USS Indianapolis was hit by a kamikaze during the Battle of Okinawa that led to its being brought back to Mare Island. It almost sunk, of course, 
and in the, no, it's a sequence of events which caused it to li- deliver the atomic bomb to Tinian for, for the Hiroshima bomb. But, you know, a lot of people don't remember that the Missouri was also struck by a kamikaze. It was a tangential blow. The kamikaze came on the starboard side, stern to aft, and, and the port wing of that kamikaze airplane uh, struck below the waterline, actually impacted and uh, penetrated the ship to some extent. It didn't do a lot of damage, but it did hit. And the next day, the, the body of the kamikaze pilot was found in the wreckage of that airplane. And the crew actually hand-sewed a Japanese flag and conducted a, and, and shrouded him with this hand-sewed Japanese flag and conducted a burial at sea right here on the starboard quarter of the Missouri within a, a day or two of that kamikaze pilot died. His name was... Petty Officer Second Class Ishino, and they even went as far as to find um, some information on him after the war was over to, to give informa- as much as they could to Ishino's family. So that's the kamikaze incident on the Missouri. So this is a 16-inch round. Um, I think that is a shape of an armor-piercing round. There's been a lot of questions about, you know, how the, these um, were used in that big gun. And, you know, we've answered most of the questions, but remember, the projectile was rammed into the gun, and then propellant bags were loaded behind the projectile. So there were quasi-hydraulic systems that, you know, assisted the gun crew in loading, but projectile separate from the propellant. That's the important point. So here we are in the wardroom of the Missouri. You know, Navy guys will know that, Navy guys and gals will know that um, the president of the wardroom is usually the XO. The captain has his own mess on big ships, not on submarines, I'm afraid. The, and the admiral would have his own mess. So even though this was the third fleet flagship with Admiral Halsey in command of the third fleet, He had his own mess, and he would only rarely come down here to eat in the wardroom and only upon invitation by the president of the mess, the XO. Um, Same thing with the captain, by the way. The captain would would not come down here and eat unless he was invited to come down and eat. But we want to take a look at the wardroom. um, The model of the ship I don't think was here during the war that put in as part of the renovation, restoration as a museum. But let's walk around and and have a look at how big this wardroom is. So in contrast, my my wardroom had, my ship had 12 officers, a submarine, uh, of course. So my wardroom would have consisted of maybe one of these tables, maybe a little bit longer than this because we needed to seat 12. Um, No, no, we only could seat eight at a time. So we need to seat seat eight people around our wardroom table. But... You can see how big this is. Uh, the ship had, I'm thinking, 70 or 80 officers on board. Now, they couldn't all eat at once, and that's just the ship's company. And then you had Admiral Halsey's staff, the flag staff, that also would eat down here. So there would probably be three or four servings in the wardroom uh, before everybody got fed. And, of course, there's the cruise mess, which is substantially bigger. But... This is a very well-appointed um, wardroom. I would say that the, there's a model of the new USS Missouri, which is a Virginia-class submarine, in this in a case here as well. Um, but I, I think I do think this map that's on the wall here in the wardroom dates from initial commission, and so this would have been um, here during the war. And so it's a pretty impressive map. Um, it's a lot of fun to look at. There are some tape. There would have been more tables in here. Some of them take taken out to put displays in. Um, but and there's been upgrades. This covering on the top on these tables, these wardroom tables, is made out of a material that we call naga hide. Uh, it's the hide of the naga animal. There is no such thing. It's a synthetic. I'm joking about the naga animal, but we it is. It's a synthetic called Nagahide. Almost all Navy ships use this in modern times. That wouldn't have been here during World War II, but most of the layout is exactly the way it would have been. 
So no air conditioning in the bridge. <laughs> it's this, this is the navigation bridge. There is an, actually an open bridge above, which is used mostly for, for weapons direction and things like that. So let's come, come around. Now this, the battleships often had this concept called the conning tower concept. So when they were being bombarded by shells, the helmsmen, Lee helmsmen, and, and many of the folks that operated the ship, that controlled the ship, would be inside this conning tower, which is armored, an armored con conning tower. So this hatch would be shut. And you can take a look in there and see how uh, secure they are in there. So they would receive their orders for course and speed and things like that from the officer of the deck, who would be outside on the navigation bridge over here. And so we're going around to the uh, forward area of the conning tower. So the conning tower, they actually had little ports that they could look out <laughs> to see the outside world. Um, uh, but they had blast shields over those ports that did a little bit, not a lot, really for, for fragmented glass and stuff like that. So this has been updated, obviously, in the post-Reagan recommissioning of the Missouri. But the, the captain's chair is um, in the same location. It's a different model and style captain's chair than would have been here during World War II. But, you know, this is kind of the layout as it would have been. So um, that's the navigation bridge. Now here's the, um, the navigation station where voyage navigation occurred, voyage planning and things like that. There was also an additional nav plot on the navigation bridge. But this is where the hardcore course, you know, development, uh, voyage planning would occur uh, to be approved by the captain. The captain had actually two cabins on major warships, so in fact most warships. There would be kind of a more elaborate, spread out cabin in a more stable location, but the ca captain would also want very rapid access to the bridge should something happen. So while they were at sea, he had a second cabin, which is called the captain's sea cabin. And it's smaller, and more austere, but very vital because it's three steps away from the navigation bridge. So go ahead and take a look. We talk a lot in this podcast about the breakthroughs that occurred at Station Hypo. And I revealed to you, I shared with you, that when I was Commodore here, sadly, the room that was where Station Hypo operated was being used as a furniture closet of all things. Well, I can tell you that it's no longer been used, being used as a furniture closet, so sadly... So unfortunately, I wasn't able to gain permission to take you down the steps, but this is Station Hypo. We talked so much about it. I wanted to show you the, you know, the plaque that rightfully commemorates the existence of this place because so many important events during World War II through the Battle of Midway, that's very famous, you know, um, you know, the, the, the breaking of the code that determined that, yes, Midway was in fact the Japanese target. A whole bunch of things throughout the war occurred down those steps at Station Hypo. So I just thought I needed to show you that such a place does exist. So how could we visit Pearl Harbor without visiting the Holy of Holies? as it pertains to the December 7th attack, which is the USS Arizona. Unfortunately, while the Navy provided me great support in giving me access to all these wonderful sites that I remember from my days in the Navy, the Arizona is run not by the Navy, but by the National Park Service. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to break the code on getting the National Park Service's permission to film at the Arizona. They told me I need a filming permit, which I wasn't able to get during my visit here. So I'm not bringing you to the Arizona. I'm sorry to say the good news is there are plenty of iPhone videos people apparently surreptitiously took at the Arizona since none of those folks had um, filming permits. Apparently, if you're a Navy captain, you need one. But if you're a civilian with an iPhone, you don't. We won't go there. So, but the bad news is I'm not able to take you there. 
please don't neglect going to YouTube and looking all the other wonderful videos you'll find there on the Arizona. So that's it. That's our tour of Pearl Harbor. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got a lot out of this. These are important historic sites that should not be lost to our public consciousness. They're as important to America's and, and really our allies' involvement in World War II as anything we could possibly imagine. So that's it for this week's episode of The Unauthorized History of the Pacific War. I'm Captain Toady, and for Seth Parrott and my partner in crime this week, we're out. <laughs>